I'll um, begin with the confession that I have a primeval fear of all manifestors, manifestors of any sort. So, so let's um, let's begin by by let's say welcoming these two manifestors. Yes, they've made an effort, but also keeping it in mind that that manifestors do not generally allow for evolutionary space. And um, I'll just go through these these comments as in three sections. One is to look at what is common to both these manifestors and ask why they were done. Two, um, this question of do we need manifestos? And three, the question of engagement with existing knowledge systems. It is a very Eurocentric view of, of knowledge. Um, what, is, what is common to the two? First is both of them are concerned about sustainability. <coughs> that they've really emphasized the need for rethinking the way development is taking place and the way knowledge is used in development processes globally and within this country, yes. Both manifestos have a university involved and involved or university experts involved very actively with other members from, from the world of the civic space as an informal knowledge and so on. So there is, there is a strong university origin and I think this is important for us, especially within CSIRS councils, to think about how is it that the space is opened up within universities and it is not opened up for us as government scientists. <laughs> so that, that's, that's a crucial question for us. Um, the, the third common point is that it is European funding and the European creative space that is responsible for creating both. I mean, just both the manifestos have been supported with European funding and some, let's say, mobilization of creative space. Again, a question that this country needs to ask itself. Um, and both build on some kind of, let's say, learning from the previous generation. I mean, the, the ideas, uh, let's say, the Sussex Manifesto, John Toy, and there's also a whole range of, let's say, thinkers, development practitioners, people who thought about where this world should be going, I mean, UNESCO, and there's a whole range of collaborations that created the first manifesto, the Sussex Manifesto, and this is kind of taking on from that, and the Knowledge Swaraj Manifesto takes on from the Indian Swaraj document, and thinking about Swaraj and development patterns, questions of sustainability and trusteeship, what role does it play? So in a way, this, this kind of lays the common ground for these two manifestos. Um, what, is, what is different is there is a certain, uh, let's say, nationalism or, or a certain Indianness about the knowledge for that manifesto and a question of universal changes or universal thinking. Again, this, the Knowledge Swaraj Manifesto can also become universal, but we should we'll come to that in a, in a moment. <laughs> what is, what is uh, again, uh, that, that of, of concern for us here is that these debates, again, the debate between Tagore and Gandhi about, about universalism is something that we should keep in mind when we talk about manifestos and what they, what they do, do to our knowledge systems. Now, um, I'll, I'll very briefly, um, let's say, uh, given that, that Rishi mentioned the, the datas, uh, talk about, about the model of S&T and innovation in this country that we have building research organizations, building S&T capacities. We've broadly had, let's say, one, the Tata's model, and the other is the Patnagar model. You know, find the people, give them the resources, and create capacities for them to create excellence in science, build the research labs, and fill it with people, the second model. So, and both these models draw from, again, a very, very prominent debate between Bernal and Polanyi about the Republic of Science, which Polanyi said has a way of reinventing and growing, its, uh, growing on its own, a certain agency that science has on its own, and Bernal's argument about the state need, the state's need to organize science to meet its social and political objectives. Um, given the way Indian science has gone and the, the nature of exclusion, which I think was mentioned in, in, in the first session, about, about the causal relationships between science and poverty. I mean, we know that, that there, there have been certain impacts which were not intended, but, well, given that we didn't think of it, I think science needs to think of what model do we follow, the state-organized science, despite all this argument about the market and so on, how has the state done, what has the state done, and what has what is public sector science done thus far? So in this, in this context, I'll, I'll elaborate a little in the next point on, on the nature of institutions. Again, institutions as, uh, yeah, as ways of working, values, norms, you know, 
ways of governing our organizations, not as organizations, but institutions as, as organizations. Now, um, Adrian mentioned in the, in the, in the new manifesto that the fear of getting locked in, and um, locking in, in in technological systems or in technological choices is perhaps something that societies can break off, and we know historically that they have. But institutional lock-ins, institutional lock-ins are dangerous and are sometimes regressive, and there is no scope of getting out of them unless there is really strong political action. So there is, there is a, a fear of lock-in that we must all be wary about, uh, and institutional lock-ins are the most dangerous. And this, this comes out in the manifestos in part, but I think we need to re-emphasize the need for being wary of institutional lock-ins. The, um, the, what, is, what is, again, a little, um, let's say, worrisome about both these manifestos is, is this agenda or you know, recommendations for policy making and so on. I mean, understanding policy processes and, um, and critiquing them is very important. A critique of science is crucial. But to make recommendations for policy making, um, like I started, it doesn't <coughs> give or allow space for evolution. And for instance, I mean, let's assume that, that this causal relationship that, that, that both, the, both the manifestos seem, seem to emphasize, the causal relationship between knowledge or s and organized, organized s and and the environment and poverty. Um, and the, the, the assumption is that you have to expand or provide funding to include environment and poverty. Now, the, the very idea that new transdisciplinary ter terrains may emerge outside formal s and and reverse the causal relationship between environmental problems and the sciences that will respond to these is, is not being reflected in, in both the manifestos. And we need to think of different options or different causal relationships in the terrain of knowledge and development. Um, now, the, the last point about, about Europe, the Lisbon Agenda, uh, Brian Brent's paper, and uh, the European, uh, the, the EU Green Paper on research, which, which Shambhu mentioned. Now, uh, here again, the, the causal relationship, um, let's say, or the epistemic configurations are more or less the same as it was before, I mean, or, or as we've known it over the past, past 50, 100 years. That what is, what is demanded is for civil, civil society, or you know, the, like, like any actor in the civic space between the state and the individual, whether it is an industry or a firm or a farm or, or us as consumers or us as you know, parents to, to participate in the s and agenda, to participate in research and innovation. The reverse causality of organized science participating in the social concerns of, I mean, in other words, that how question, the inverted model that, that we heard about in the morning, which illustrated the need for s and organized science or any informal knowledge efforts to, to open up and engage with broader social issues that seems to be impossible given this framework. So we need to again ask ourselves how that is possible. <laughs> now, uh, we've, we've also seen in, in both the manifestos the, the scope for, um, let's say, oh, the, the, the need to, to create space for technological possibilities. Um, I mentioned this before, that, that the space for institutional possibilities is perhaps the greatest concern in this country and, and in any developing country perhaps in Europe too. But, but unless and until we, we recognize that institutional possibilities are crucial to create even technological possibilities and to enable technological possibilities, the choice of, of the parts that are open, when you don't have the institutional possibilities, that is, again, ways of working, values, norms that are available for people to choose from, to govern themselves, the nature of Swaraj itself, once those, once those institutional possibilities are opened up, there is space for technological possibilities. So there is a need to understand the causal relationship between the two, again, which may vary depending on the kind of institutional evolution that is possible in each society. Um, and this, again, is crucial for both India as a developing country struggle to, I mean, struggling to meet growth with equity kind of objectives and so on. But also, and more importantly, perhaps, is it's important for Europe. In this, in this stage of, let's say, global economic changes and so on, Europe needs to learn to live with and learn from other cultures of innovation. And that learning is more important to us, perhaps, today, given that we have all inherited, I mean, all of us in this, in this room as, as English-speaking and writing, you know, 
people in whatever forms we are engaged with as practitioners or scientists and so on. Uh, for us uh, to, to engage with this kind of a, a, a institutional space that does exist around us, but we our, our learning and our formal education systems haven't given us the scope to engage with these in constructive ways, other than asking for their participation in our agenda. So what is what is what is crucial is that Europe and we, who are in, 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 any, in, in any case trained in these knowledge systems, must have the capacity to learn with, from and with other cultures of innovation, which I will mention in the morning, other ways of knowing nature. And I mean, there, was, there was mention about SRI in, 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 in Shambhu's presentation. The, the difference between SRI and a conventional cultivation system is most crucially in the engagement with nature, where you see agriculture in the environment and agriculture versus the environment. And all of modern agriculture, all of production systems, all the production systems that we have in, in, in modern agriculture today see agriculture versus the environment. So herbivory is not seen as herbivory, but as pest attack. That the plant leaves 5% of its energy in any case for a pest attack or to feed a pest population, what we consider pests that a plant consider its, considers its neighbors and has evolved to adapt to these neighbor, neighborhood populations. So those are not taught. I mean, there's the, the concept of philocrons, you know, the time between the emergence of two leaves in a rice plant. That is not taught. That is a Japanese concept, concept in crop physiology. We've never learned that as, as science graduates. So our, our inheritance of European knowledge systems is something that we really need to, to engage with. Um, last but not the least, let us let us take <laughs> let us take take this to take this as an opportunity to 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 make sure that we do not replace our current Eurocentric knowledge systems with an Indocentric or a Cenocentric knowledge system. That would be extremely dangerous. What we really need is um, again to, to to quote something that Shampu said earlier. I mean the the. the to create your own institutional possibilities, to create your own manifestos, create your own ways of doing things that, that, are, that are ideal for your social and environmental conditions, to enable justice and growth in, in most harmonious ways. Thank you.